For those of you that are not familiar with the James Madison Institute, uh, we are um, actually the, uh, the, one of the oldest uh, think tanks here in the state. We've been around for 25 years. We're, our headquarters are in uh, Tallahassee up in the state capitol. But as you can see, we get all around the state. Uh, we do events like this. Um, we are focused on research and education. Uh, we provide public policy research to our uh, state legislators and our uh, leaders in Tallahassee. Um, but we get out there and educate citizens as well. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with us, I encourage you to visit our website at jamesmadison.org. Um, we're just 12 days away from you know, one of the most historic elections uh, in many of our lifetimes. And, um, but we, we're all focused on the presidential race and for some on the U.S. Senate race and congressional races. But if, if for those of you here that are Florida voters, um, we have quite a number of amendments on the, on the ballot as well. And some of them can be quite long and confusing. And I encourage you before you go to the polls to study up on them because believe me, I got my ballot in the mail and, there, and there's paragraphs per each of some of these amendments. Uh, the James Madison Institute, one of the services we provide to the citizens of Florida, the residents of Florida, is to, um, you know, uh, is a voter's guide. And so that's actually uh, available for free on our website at jamesmadison.org. And you can, we give you what each side is saying about the amendment, the pro, the con, and then our own analysis and even a suggested uh, vote based on uh, the conclusions we've come to at the Institute. Um, but I also uh, want to welcome everybody here that is not here, but is uh, watching this uh, debate online. We want to thank uh, FreedomWorks uh, for providing the online streaming for that. Uh, I know many are tuning in across the country at live.freedomworks.org, um, and we just want to thank uh, that organization for uh, putting that together and, and, and streaming this live so that we could reach a much broader audience than are even here at Nova Southeastern University in Fort Lauderdale. Um, I also want to recognize some of our staff that is here. I see uh, Bill Maddox, our resident fellow, actually walking up right here. Um, you probably uh, saw Jenny Stone, our donor relations manager, and Joe Russo, um, our major gifts manager. Uh, they're, they're both here uh, today. Uh, but we also have some great staff back at JMI headquarters that were instrumental in putting this uh, together. Uh, one being our president, Bob McClure. Uh, who's been our president and CEO for the last eight years and has really uh, seen the Institute grow over those uh, years. And also our uh, vice president of communications, uh, Valerie Wickbolt, uh, who, who arranged many of the, the uh, things here today as well. So um, uh, thank them. Uh, finally, I also want to thank the Arthur N. Roop Foundation uh, with, for a generous grant to help put together this debate and bring these uh, two distinguished speakers uh, to Nova Southeastern University. Uh, we also have another number of organizations um, that have helped promote this event, and I just want to give a quick thank you to them, uh, one being the Florida Chamber of Commerce, the Florida Realtors Association, the, the Associated Builders and Contractors of Florida's East Coast, uh, the Broward Workshop, and Broward College. And most especially, I want to state, um, thank uh, the folks, particularly Judy Stein and all the folks over at the National Institute for Edu Educational Choice, which is located right here on the Nova Southeastern University campus, for all, all of their help in this as well. For those of you in the audience that might be on Twitter, um, and also for many of those of you that are watching online, uh, we are going to take a couple of questions in the Q&A debate tonight from Twitter. Um, if you use the hashtag pound JMI debate, again, that's pound JMI debate, uh, please comment during the, uh, during the uh, debate, and w other people that are following that hashtag can, uh, can see your comments. But um, you can also ask uh, some questions uh, via that, and we'll take a couple questions from Twitter there tonight. Again, that's pound JMI debate. Uh, but just wanted to welcome uh, you all here, and um, for those of you uh, that you know, are watching from afar, I know one of our um, guests here today that came in to do this event uh, for the video uh, mentioned how he was happy to be in a swing state because he finally got to hear about hear all the commercials and all the political ads. And I said, well, you can have them and take them with you because I'm kind of tired of them. And I know many of you here are as well, but I think that actually shows the importance of the place we're standing at tonight here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, uh, on the, well, Davie particularly here, uh, but in South Florida, and the importance that Florida plays in the eyes of the nation. It's really exciting for us to work at a think tank focused on public policy in Florida because we field calls virtually every day from all around the country, whether it's an election year or not, on what is going on in Florida, whether that be in education reform or healthcare reform, property taxes, you know, property rights, property taxes, all these sorts of issues um, that Florida's been dealing with for a decade or more, uh, the nation is now dealing with. 
And so we have all the demographics here in Florida. Uh, I travel around Florida all the time, and it's amazing how different each and every part of this state is from other parts of the state, how different the people are, the cultures, the, the, uh, the food even, uh, you know, everything. So it's, uh, it's really uh, an exciting place to be, and you're sometimes sick of all the people paying so much attention to Florida that you're getting swamped with ads, but it's also uh, neat to see that we play such a vital role in the future of our country. So um, tonight we're going to see... Uh, a little bit of, of how the debates are shaping out in our country. And um, first, what I, who I want to introduce is our, uh, is our moderator, Marshall DeRosa. And before I introduce him, I do want to say he's a professor over at Florida Atlantic University, um, and he's also a senior fellow with the James Madison Institute. Uh, what Marshall is also, he's very concerned about the future of our country, and, and in addition to his day job at, at Florida Atlantic University, he also um, does some civic education seminars partnering with the James Madison Institute over at Florida Atlantic University. They're free seminars um, for students and for young people that want to learn more about the Constitution and our founding principles and where those principles came from to begin with. Um, so Marshall actually runs these uh, seminars uh, over at FAU. We have some literature out on the back table for those of you uh, that are interested in, in coming over and we, we give you a free book and, and, and it's, a, um, it's really a great opportunity. Just three sessions, uh, basically three evenings during the semester. Um, so I encourage you to get involved with Professor DeRosa. Um, and again, uh, for those of you sh uh, watching this online, you can find that information at jamesmadison.org. But uh, Professor DeRosa received his PhD and master's uh, from the University of Houston and his BA from West Virginia University. Uh, he's also taught at Davis and Elkins College, uh, Louisiana State University, and now at Florida uh, Atlantic University, where he's been since 1990. Um, Professor DeRosa, in addition to being a senior fellow with the James Madison Institute, is also a Salvatore Fellow with the Heritage Foundation. Um, he's published many articles and reviews in professional journals, uh, book chapters, and three books. I understand he's working on a book right now as well. Um, but his teaching specialization is on American constitutional law and policymaking, international law, and American society, and the judicial process. So I think pretty well equipped to uh, handle debate on the, moderating debate on the role of government uh, in the economy tonight. Uh, Professor DeRosa resides in Wellington, Florida with his wife and four children. I'd like to welcome up here, him up here tonight. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you. Well, good evening, and I want to applaud those in attendance for uh, braving the bad weather to participate in this important event. Um, and it is very important because I hope you'll be able to discern two different visions for America. And in this election year, I know we're saturated and probably tired of all the debates, but you're going to see two very thoughtful individuals give their perspective on a very important question. And before I introduce them, let me just uh, give you an idea as to what the ground rules are for the debate this evening. As you know, the, uh, the title of this program is The Role of Government in Economic Growth and Job Creation. And this morning, I emailed uh, our two debaters and asked them to consider this question. Has the U.S. government's role in the economy, particularly since the economic crisis of 2008, been beneficial or detrimental to the long-term economic growth and prosperity? And I'm going to direct that question uh, initially to uh, Michael Grunewald. He'll make an opening comment or statement that will run for about 12 minutes. Matt Kibbe will respond with his remarks in 12 minutes. And then we'll go to rebuttals and rebuttals and more rebuttals. And it should run for about 48 minutes. And after these two gentlemen are uh, through making their presentations and having a robust discussion about this important question. We're going to open it up to Q&A. And uh, there are two mics on each side of the room. You could probably get a sense when we move into the Q&A session. But just line up, and if you do have a question, please make it brief and to the point. Uh, no long-winded speeches or comments, just you know, a thoughtful question that the people here and also the people out in cyberspace might be interested in hearing their perspective and answers to. 
Now, with that said, let me introduce our two prestigious participants. I'm going to begin with Michael Grunewald. Michael Grunewald is an author and a senior national correspondent for Time Magazine. He has won the George Polk Award for National Reporting, the Worth Bingham Prize for Investigative Reporting, the Society of Environmental Journalists Award for In-Depth Reporting, and many other honors. After growing up on Long Island and graduating from Harvard College, Mike spent six years as a reporter for the Boston Globe. In July 1998, he joined the national staff of the Washington Post, where he was an investigative reporter, political reporter, New York bureau chief, and Outlook essayist. He also wrote the lead story on the September 11th attacks. He joined Time in September of 2007 and has written cover stories on topics ranging from the future of California to the future of the Republican Party. He wrote the, the Person of the Year profile of Ben Bernanke. He also blogs at Swampland and recently started a column for Time about energy. Mike has also contributed to the New, York, New Republic, Slate, Foreign Policy, and other publications. In 2006, Mike authored his first book, The Swamp, The Everglades, Florida, and the Politics of Paradise. In August 2012, he published his second book, The New Deal, or The New New Deal, The Hidden Story of Change in the Obama Era. Mike is married to Christina, Christina Dominguez, an attorney. They live in South Beach with their son, Max, their daughter, Lena, and the Boston Terrier, Shamu, and Candy. So please give a warm welcome to Mike. Mike, if you would come up on the stage. Thank you. Matt Kibbe. Matt Kibbe is president and CEO of Freedom Works. He has been with the organization for over 15 years. An economist by training, Matt Kibbe is a well-respected national public policy expert, best-selling author, and political commentator. He also serves as distinguished senior fellow at the Austrian Economic Center in Vienna, Austria. Newsweek has called Kibbe one of the masterminds of the Tea Party politics. Expertise which has led to frequent appearances on national news shows, including Fox News, NBC, ABC News, CNN, MSNBC, <coughs> excuse me, Fox Business, PBS, and C-SPAN. In 2012, Kibbe authored Hostile Takeover, Resisting Centralized Government Strang Stranglehold on America, revealing how the centralized bureaucracy of government is eroding our hard-fought freedoms and how the Tea Party movement can return America to decentralized, to the decentralized vision of the founders. Dubbed the scribe by the New York Daily News, Kibbe is co-author with Dick Army of the 2010 New York Times bestseller, Give Us Liberty, a Tea Party Manifesto. Liberally expropriating from the leftist organizer Saul Alinsky, Kibbe also authored Rules for Patriots, a pocket primer for patriotic Americans. He has written for the Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Investors Business Daily, Politico, The Washington Examiner, and numerous other national and online publications. He is also a regular contributor to Forbes.com, Red State, and FoxNews.com. So please give a warm welcome to Matt. Okay, gentlemen, I'm going to uh, sort of time you on your <laughs> allotted time for uh, your opening statements and rebuttals. So before we begin, let me restate the question, and this is directed to Michael. Michael, has the U.S. government's role in the economy, particularly since the economic crisis of 2008, been beneficial or detrimental to long-term economic growth and prosperity? Well, thank you very much for coming, and uh, thanks to JMI for inviting me to take the left side of this debate over, about government. I'm really looking forward to journalists uh, debating an economist about economics. It, it doesn't really seem fair. <laughs> but uh, I'll start with a little, <clears throat> a little caveat. I'm, uh, I'm not much of a lefty. I'm, uh, I'm certainly left of, left of Freedom Works. I think uh, Ronald Reagan would have been left of Freedom Works. <laughs> but uh, I'm, a, I'm a kind of middle of the road guy. It's, it's true that I'm fine with some government investments in the economy. And just as Lincoln invested in the Transcontinental Railroad and launched land-grant colleges during the Civil, while the Civil War was raging, 
I support investments in infrastructure and education and other national priorities today. Um, but our, you know, our economy is already way more than a little bit pregnant. And I think that in many fields, particularly energy, the libertarian fantasy of a purely free market merely ends up protecting incumbents that benefit from existing market failures. At the same time, though, you know, liberals keep unfollowing me on Twitter because I keep calling for Big Bird's head on a pike. And uh, some of you may have read my recent cover story in Time about our subsidized lives, which was partly dedicated to the proposition that big government does too many things and provides too many benefits to people like me. You know, there's a, you hear a lot about a grand bargain in Washington. You know, Matt's a principled, limited government conservative, which is a, quite a rare species in Washington. And I actually suspect that we could go backstage and cut a long-term deficit reduction deal in, in 20 minutes. All right, we'll start by killing all the farm subsidies. We'll privatize the post office and the Army Corps of Engineers. We'll get rid of the home mortgage interest deduction. We cool? Do we have to go on? Done. All right, done. All right we're done. All right. <laughs> this is uh, <laughs> it's fun. By the way, uh, af after last week, I think this debating tactic of preemptively agreeing with your opponent will be known as Romneying. Okay. <laughs> But don't worry, uh, Matt and I are going to have plenty to debate about the role of the public sector and the private economy, especially the role of the public sector when the private sector is flatlining, GDP is crashing at an 8.9% annual rate, and the economy is shedding 800,000 jobs a month. In 2008, 2009, the federal government stepped in by bailing out the banking sector, which was hideously unpopular but unbelievably successful. It averted an unfathomable financial collapse and actually is going to turn a profit for taxpayers. Uh, the feds also rescued the U.S. auto industry, which was also hideously unpopular and also unbelievably successful. Instead of a liquidation that would have obliterated a million jobs, GM and Chrysler are selling cars and making money. And the Federal Reserve also helped stabilize the financial system and avoid crippling deflation with massive infusions of monetary stimulus. But I'm going to focus on President Obama's $800 billion fiscal stimulus, which may seem like an odd choice. A uh, year after it passed, the percentage of Americans who believed that it had created any jobs was lower than the percentage of Americans who believed that Elvis was alive. But hey, you know, I, I wrote a book about it. And the stimulus is really a case study in how government can help the economy in the short term by preventing a depression and ending a recession, but also in the long term by making investments that help solve national problems. Uh, these days, of course, Obama won't even say the S word, but back before, I don't know, about January 20th, 2009, the, uh, I don't know what happened that day, but the notion of counter-cyclical Keynesian stimulus during a severe downturn was not really controversial. Every 2000, 2008 presidential candidate had a stimulus plan, and Mitt Romney's was the largest. Paul Ryan and most of his House Republican colleagues voted for a $715 billion stimulus alternative that was extremely similar to Obama's $787 billion assault on free enterprise. So I'm going to read from my book where I tried to explain the point of Keynesian stimulus. A friend of mine told me that this is actually the most boring page of the book, but I figure if, uh, if we're going to talk about it, we ought to know what it is. Before the Great Depression, most economists believed markets were automatically self-correcting. They assumed all downturns would eventually create a virtuous cycle. Cheaper prices would spur consumption, cheaper money would spur investment, and lower wages would spur hiring. It was an elegant theory, but after the crash of 1929, reality didn't cooperate. President Hoover's Treasury Secretary, Andrew Mellon, expressed the orthodoxy of his day when he described the Depression as a useful corrective to sloth and excess that would purge the rottenness out of the system. If you weren't a Mellon, though, the Depression was pretty rotten. Now, John Maynard Keynes saw recessions as simple failures of demand for goods and services, not some kind of karmic retribution for moral turpitude. And he saw how a convulsive shock like Black Tuesday could create a vicious rather than a virtuous cycle. Lost income leads to lost confidence, which leads to hoarding of cash, which leads to layoffs and cutbacks that leave productive workers and equipment idle, which further depresses income as well as confidence, and so on down the drain. 
Part of the problem was a real deterioration of purchasing power. Workers without jobs can't spend as much, even when prices are low. And businesses without customers can't invest or hire as much, even when interest rates and wages are low. The other part of the problem was psychological, what Keynes called animal spirits. Workers worried about losing their jobs and businesses worried about losing their customers would tighten their belts too, perpetuating this paralyzing feedback loop. So Keynes concluded that the solution to both parts of the problem was an aggressive government effort to revive demand, an infusion of cash and confidence. Saving had always been considered purely a good thing, but Keynes saw that in a crisis, what was needed was more spending. More saving would just deepen the crisis. That's the paradox of thrift. And when consumers and businesses were too broke or too scared to spend, government would have to be the spender of last resort. Budget deficits had always been considered purely a bad thing, but Keynesians saw that when the private sector hunkered down and demand dried up, the public sector needed to send more money into the economy than it took back in taxes, either by cutting taxes or raising spending or both. Once consumers started spending again, businesses would hire more workers and make new investments, and the virtuous cycle could begin anew. Again, Keynes wasn't rejecting capitalism, just the laissez-faire assumption that a shattered economy could always heal itself. He wasn't recommending a new car. He said it just needed a new magneto, an ignition system, kind of jumpstart for a stalled economic engine. So FDR basically tried that in his first term through elements of the New Deal, and it worked. It reduced unemployment every year. It came down from 25% when he took over to 14% after his first term. Then he famously turned towards austerity in 1937. He had, after all, promised to balance the budget, and the economy lurched right back into recession. Then, of course, came World War II, the biggest fiscal stimulus program in history, and the Depression was over. In 2008 and 2009, there were a few principled conservatives who made the Mellon case for purging the rottenness out of the system. One of the, my favorite characters in the book was uh, South Carolina Governor Mark Sanford, who likes to point out that he was Tea Party before Tea Party was cool. Now, during the Bush era, he was a harsh critic of the Washington Republicans who spent like drunken sailors and obliterated the Clinton surpluses. He argued that the economic crisis was a perfect opportunity to roll back big government, balance our budget, and start paying down debt. Now, he admitted this would probably cause a depression in the short run. It was going to cause an awful lot of pain, but it would make us stronger in the long run. And that's a legitimate argument, I think. Now, I think it's a bit of a nutty argument. Depressions you'll excuse my French, they really suck. And, uh, and aside from all the human tragedy, they end up blowing up deficits and debts because people without jobs and corporations without profits don't pay taxes. But it was an honest alternative to trying to save the economy without stimulus. But the Obama stimulus was 50% larger than the entire New Deal in constant dollars. And most of it was standard Keynesian stimulus. It put money in people's pockets through $300 billion in tax cuts that went to more than 95% of the workforce, $100 billion in unemployment benefits and other aid to victims of the Great Recession. It gave every senior citizen and disabled veteran a $250 check. Its direct transfers alone would keep 7 million Americans out of poverty and make 32 million Amer poor Americans less poor. And it also included more than $150 million billion in aid to states so that they wouldn't have to raise taxes because they have balanced budget requirements, wouldn't have to do these massive layoffs of teachers of cops, and dramatic rollbacks in Medicaid's and other services at the worst possible time. So it did ease a lot of pain, and it worked. I had hoped to show a few graphs, but uh, they don't have the AV set up here, so you're going to have to use your imagination. First, picture behind me a mountain. That's my line graph of new unemployment claims. They start around 350,000 right before the recession begins in December 2007, and then they go up, 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 up. At that rate, we actually would have lost an entire Canadian economy in 2009. Then Obama signs the stimulus in February 2009. We're up to already over 600,000. That's like right about the part of the mountain where they, uh, they tell you on the chairlift to get your tips up and get ready to unload, right? And then comes the spring the other side of the mountain. Down, 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 down. The second quarter after the stimulus passed was the biggest improvement in employment numbers in 30 years. And now, of course, we're back down to 350,000. And uh, the flip side is you can picture an upside down mountain. That's the bar graph of new private sector jobs, which 
starts at about zero at the beginning of the recession and goes down to negative 800,000 when Obama's taking office. The stimulus passes and it goes back up, 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 up to zero in early 2010, now stabilized around 150,000 to 200,000 new jobs a month. It's not good, but it beats a free fall. And recoveries after financial cataclysms are always long and nasty. Like uh, Larry Summers said in December 2008, FDR was lucky. He took office after three years of depression. Everyone knew it was Hoover's depression. When Obama took office, the financial earthquake had hit, but the economic tsunami hadn't really reached the shore. Mike, so, we have one minute. Oh, sure. So the, uh, the people didn't really have a sense that the stimulus made the economy look less, less bad. Look, there have, been, there have been 13 statistically significant studies of the stimulus, some using models, some empirical data, and 12 concluded that the stimulus significantly boosted growth and employment. General consensus is that it added 2 to 4% to GDP in its peak, which is the difference between growth and contraction. The only contrarian voice was John Taylor. Taylor, who said the stimulus didn't work, but if you look at his data, he's essentially arguing that the stimulus wasn't big enough. And the countries that, like Great Britain and Spain that made our 1937 mistake and embraced austerity, they tumbled right back into recession like the Keynesians predicted. Now, I guess I'm going to be running out of time, but the stimulus was also the purest distillation of change we can believe in. It included the largest investments in infrastructure since the Eisenhower administration. Our bridges and airports are dilapidated and congested. Those are market failures that make our larger economy less competitive. The stimulus included the largest one-time research investments ever. Throughout our history, government research has led to advances like the internet and GPS technology, industries like biotech and semiconductors. And yeah, it included $90 billion for clean energy and energy efficiency, which will reduce our dependence on foreign petrothugs that hate us, our carbon emissions that are broiling the planet, our vulnerability to price shocks that ravage our economy every time there's a storm in the Gulf or the mess in the Middle East. We'll also jumpstart some of these green industries of the future where the US has an innovation advantage. It's funny, Romney claims that half the recipients have gone bankrupt. In fact, it's way less than 1%. In the stimulus, it didn't just invest in Solyndra or in solar manufacturing or in solar, invented, invested in the entire food chain, wind, solar, and other renewables, energy efficiency in every imaginable form, smart grid, clean coal, advanced biofuels, electric vehicles, research into the green technology of the future, and it financed thousands of technological and entrepreneurial approaches. Right, we're over time. All right, let me just, uh, let me just wrap up. Because you hear about, a lot about Solyndra, but you probably haven't heard that solar installations increased 1,000% since the stimulus. Solar costs have plunged by two-thirds, which is why Solyndra failed, but also why SolarCity is going public. And it's now America's second fastest growing industry. Basically, when I wrote this book, because there ought to be great debates about the lessons of the stimulus. But we ought to be talking about the real stimulus, not some imaginary stimulus boondoggle that poured money into levitating trains to Disneyland and mob museums and snowmaking machines in Duluth and all kinds of nonsense that isn't in the actual stimulus. Came in on time, under budget, remarkably fraud free. The critics said it would cause hyperinflation. Uh, actually, the experts predicted 5 to 7%. So far, it's been 0.001%. Critics said it would cause hyperinflation. Inflation has remained low. Critics said it would cause interest rates to soar. Interest rates are historically low. The economy isn't where anyone would like it to be, but it's amazing that anyone would even ask whether we're better off than we were four years ago. Four years ago, we were in a ditch. Government dragged us out. Thank you, Mike. Matt? Well, first of all, let me point out that tonight is my anniversary. My lovely wife, Terry, is over there. <laughs> and I've set out as a goal for tonight, I, I didn't quite realize this when I agreed to do this, but I set out as a goal tonight to do better than President Obama did in his first speech. So the bar is low. But uh, I want to start by quoting my favorite Austrian economist, a gentleman named Jeffrey Lebowski. Is anyone familiar with the movie The Big Lebowski? It's a Dude. very important film. And Jeffrey Lebowski loved to say, you know what, there's a lot of ins, there's a lot of outs, there's a lot of what have yous. And he's perfectly channeling Frederick Hayek's critique of any would-be central planner, anybody that is a government bureaucrat or a politician, anybody that presumes that somehow one person or one panel of people, the experts gathered in the room, can somehow outguess the decentralized genius of the American people. 
to put it in other ways, is, is the best way to organize the economy, to solve economic downturns, to, to pick winners and losers in the energy markets, is the best way from the top down, with the best people in the basement of the Department of Energy, or is the best way to organize from the bottom up, tapping into what, what Hayek described as the personal knowledge of individuals spread out throughout the entire economy. And just think about the question that Hayek asked when he was debating John Maynard Keynes. And he was frustrated because Keynes had, had conjured up this thing called aggregate demand. Aggregate demand, by definition, when the government spends more money, aggregate demand goes up because it's part of the definition of aggregate demand. But Hayek was trying to explain how it is that all of us in our, in our communities, in our families, with that personal knowledge that only we have, what kind of health care would be best for our family? What education is best for my kids? What are my aspirations? What are my goals? What have I failed at? What can I do better? But how is it that all these disparate people, millions and millions of people, can come together and do something that is so much bigger than they could have done by themselves? The answer is freedom. The answer is not that one of them declared unilaterally, you know what, I'm smarter than the rest of you guys. I know what's better for your kids. I know what your aspirations are, and I know best how to reorganize economic activity so that you get what you want, what you need. No, that's not how it works. But it was that idea, that, that pretense that all planners have that is the very basis of government failure. How, how could they possibly know all of those infinite pieces of information that lead to a market price, that lead to the demand for solar panels, that lead to the opportunity that is the economic ladder? Government can't do that. Even virtuous government can't do that. That's why the founders set out a model that didn't choose winners and losers. It didn't presume that we would elect the best angels to government to pick and choose, it set out a rule, a set of rules, basic rules that said everybody should be treated just like everybody else. We should have no crony collusion between the private sector and the public enforcers of the public good. And everybody should live by those same rules. That's the American idea. That's the debate we're having right now, I think between those who think that, that government can solve our problems and those who believe that government has, in fact, created the economic problem that we have right now. And I think the, uh, the, the story of not just the stimulus, but the economic situation that we're in is a classic example of a government that presumes too much, that a government that does too much, and as a result, has created a perfect storm of $16 trillion in debt. All of these programs, including all the ones that we've already agreed to eliminate, all of these disincentives for people to invest, this is where we're at. We're stuck. And it looks a lot like the Great Depression from my perspective. And not because there was a financial crisis, but because we don't seem to be able to get out of it. Classic response in a, in a private economy is a recession is typically followed by very robust economic growth. And it's that, that upturn, that dramatic upturn that happens after the recession that brings personal income back up, that brings employment back up, that, that restores all of the damage that was done during the recession. We haven't had that. Um, and we certainly didn't have that years and years after the Great Depression. And what I would argue, as someone that doesn't believe that the government can stimulate our way out of this by spending money we don't have, is that Federal Reserve policy that continues to push on a string, we continue to expand credit beyond, um, to the point where it's almost free. We continue to spend money we don't have to a point where we've had over one, over four years of trillion dollar deficits in a row. We continue to rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic so that there are winners and losers. When you do that, guess who comes to Washington? The people that want a special privilege, the people that want to game the system, 
And it's not necessarily rich versus poor. It's not Republican versus Democrat. It is typically a CEO from a failing corporation gets on his GE5. Let's, let's, let's call this hypothetical company General Electric. <laughs> and comes to Washington, sits down with the committee chairman, and cuts a deal. This is how politics works. This is how political markets work. It is never the case. It is there, you never get to that progressive ideal where the smartest, most virtuous people get together and sort through the data and decide rationally that this is what we're going to invest in. No political markets are driven by incentives. It's driven by who shows up to lobby. It's driven by the political incentives of players that want to buy certain constituencies for their vote. And it's driven by Hayek's understanding of a real world that is it's, it's radically uncertain. You don't know the future. The market is a process, and it's that discovery, it's that pushing and pulling of individuals solving problems, sometimes failing, sometimes succeeding, that produces the market signals that tell us to buy more, to buy less, to invest more, to spend less. You can't replace that process with a few smart bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. It just doesn't work that way. So my critique of big government is not that by definition, spending 700 billion that you don't have doesn't, by definition, increase economic growth in the short run. My problem is that in the long run, you continue to take more and more out of the private economy, more and more decisions are made politically instead of economically, and more and more wealth is distributed to those who show up in Washington, DC. That's not how America rolls. Okay, thank you, Matt. Michael, you have four minutes for an affirmative rebuttal. Um, well, well, we, we agree on, on some stuff, uh, but uh, I guess one of, the, one of the problems with arguing with Austrian economics is it's a little, like, it's a little bit like our, our arguing with this uh, Richard Murdoch guy, what, what's his name? The guy who said, uh, you know, it's like, well, you know, if that rape, if that rape happened, you know, God, God must have wanted it. Um, I guess if, you know, if the economy implodes and has the, uh, the worst, you know, the worst, uh, you know, economic freefall since 29, really before 29, I mean, I guess that must have been the, uh, the decentralized genius of the American people, too. Um, I think one of the problems with these theories, which are good theories and certainly internally coherent, they don't really explain why we created 23 million jobs during the socialist era of Bill Clinton um, and, then, uh, and then fell apart uh, after you know, major tax cuts in 2001 and, and 2003. Um, we certainly agree that there was... Uh, a lot of, and part of part of Keynes is that in the good times you're actually supposed to, you're not supposed to keep throwing money into the economy. That's when you're supposed to reduce the deficit, um, and of course that didn't happen when Republicans controlled Washington. I think the problem with something like like energy is that it's not a free market, um, and the idea that we should just stand stand back while you know dirty energies don't have to pay for their for their pollution. I think. Maybe, maybe Matt and I would agree that there ought to be some sort of carbon price. I kind of doubt it, but uh, but in any case, that would be a more definitely a more efficient way of doing it, and would uh, and would have less of these people, you know, the supplicants coming to Washington. But the fact is, we don't have that. Um, we do have uh, this infrastructure that's grown up around fossil fuels that are destroying the planet. And we also have these utilities that are regulated and have these complex financial incentives where they get paid more if they build more coal plants. Um, I, I, I don't deny the problems of, uh, of trying to do these complex, um, these complex investments. As I point out in the book, I think it's gone way better than anybody had any right to expect. Um, but you know there is no zero defect. There's a zero defect mentality with this stuff. But some of this stuff is going to go bad. Just like some people who get Peldrants are going to end up drunks on the street, um, and you, you're going to have your Solyndras and A123s. The hope is that some of these companies, where you're not investing in just one winner or loser, but you're investing in the whole game, um, and the hope is that some of them are going to change the game, and some of them are already starting to. Um, again, uh, the the main point is that. The, gen the genius of the free market is apparently not as concerned right now about deficits and debt as, 
as Matt is, um, I'm concerned in the long term, the long term we have a real deficit problem, um, but it's, it's because our federal government is essentially a health insurer with a big ass army. Um, and uh, you know, if you look at the future long-term growth projections, you've got healthcare costs going like this for Medicaid and Medicare, and you've got everything else kind of going like this. Our problem is healthcare costs. Uh, the stimulus actually poured $27 billion into health IT, which is a classic um, sort of free rider problem where it's not in anybody's interest to be the first guy to invest in it, but everybody knows that it's gonna improve care and reduce costs, and you're not gonna have to fill out 30, pa 30 paper pieces of paper in the, when you go to the doctor's office, and he might not kill you with his chicken scratch handwriting. Um, 30 seconds. If, uh, if the free market thought that deficits and debt were our biggest problem right now, you'd start to see the run on the dollar, you'd start to see interest rates going out of control. It's not happening. Right now, our big problem is we have a, we have a jobs problem. We could use a little more stimulus. By the way, I loved how you slipped that Murdoch thing in there. That was, that was, that was pretty classy. But let, let's talk about, um, you keep talking about market failure and the, the fact that the so-called free market um, created the economic crisis that we're in. Um, the housing bubble, as many of you know, had a lot of engineers. Most of them were government officials, um, starting with the Federal Reserve. And I, I, we have very different views on this, but, but the idea that you would, you would somehow corrupt the most important market signal, which is the price of money, and, and create false incentives for people to get into homes. Here we are in Florida, and we have this very painful adjustment where so many people bought so many houses based on a phony price. You took a mortgage that you couldn't afford, and you, you did it based on the assumption that housing prices would continue to go up. This is a classic example of a government-created bubble started by the Fed, but, but also created by the committee chairman, Barney Frank and Chris Dodd, and their cozy relationships with, with the mortgage banking industry. We've all read about that. Um, Barney Frank was, was flacking continuously for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, putting more people into houses they couldn't afford, all the way up to the bubble. And who wrote the bill to fix the problem that the government created? Barney Frank and Chris Dodd. And what happened in that bill? They further socialized risk so that the big banks, the, big, the, ba the baddest actors in the mortgage banking industry got a bailout. And they get a bailout across the board and all banks, responsible banks, irresponsible banks are asked to pay into that. Well, what happens when you socialize risk? You encourage more of it. So we're still at that point where we haven't dealt with the fact that all of the bad actors in the banking industry bailed out by the federal government, are still doing bad things. And you guys are on the hook. Everybody in this audience is going to pay for that bad acting. And who was the only actor that allowed for that? The federal government. So don't blame the market on things that the government creates. And when you have a, a government-induced bubble, the only thing you can do is, is, is the exact opposite of what we're doing. We continue to prop up fake housing prices. We continue to hope that all of those false signals and all of these people that are locked into mortgages they can't afford, we want it to stay the way it is. Well, it was never real. It was a government fiction. So the only way to solve it is to unwind it. Is that cruel? No, it is cruel that the government induced people into the bondage of a mortgage they can't afford. All right. Just not sure what a real price is. The price is a price. Um, and, uh, and, you know, whether you have loose money or tight money, um, you know, you have this decentralized genius of the American people can, uh, can make the sort of their rational decisions all the same. Um, this notion that the amount of money should depend on, you know, whether there's a minor strike going on in, in South Africa, um, is just a, well, it's a minority view. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll put it that way. It's a deeply held view by, by some people, but, um, you know, it's certainly not Milton Friedman's view, put it that way. Uh, you know, he, during the Great Depression, it was getting, it was aggressive monetary stimulus. You can kind of chart how, uh, how, the, how fast countries got out of the Great Depression by essentially when they got off the gold standard and went towards, uh, towards a more aggressive monetary stimulus policy. Um, you know, I think I'll just, you know, I'm not sure I have 
more to respond to uh, to that. I just, <laughs> you know, the idea that that you know, it's not clear why why that bubble didn't pop under under Clinton when you know when there were a lot of complaints about how you know high taxes and overregulation was going to destroy the economy, and Bush came in and there was uh, you know there were these great tax cuts and much less regulation, but it didn't end up all that well. Interestingly, there was a tech bubble um, that uh, we we didn't act on as a government. We didn't we didn't bail out all the tech companies. We didn't try to prop it up, and the net result was a fairly quick cleanup of what could have been an ongoing crisis that affected the stock market and everything else. But I, I would I would I would talk to and by the way, who 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 else here thinks that uh, the days of uh, Republican Congress and Bill Clinton look pretty good right now? Um, I'll admit that I'm not. I'm not so proud. Um, but it, it was it was a very aggressive Congress, one that actually passed a budget resolution every year, um, which is apparently a radical notion today. One that uh, offered real spending cuts and real priorities. And Bill Clinton coming back to the middle to do that, it was a combination of real fiscal restraint and economic growth that got us out of this situation. Uh, it was the exact opposite of what we're doing today. The, the, the Clinton stimulus, which was peanuts compared to the Obama stimulus, um, didn't pass. Did it pass? No, didn't pass. Yeah, that's $19 billion. Dollars. Yeah, $19 billion. <laughs> yeah. We're fighting over $19 yeah, exactly. billion, which is now a rounding error <laughs> yeah. on, on what we do. Um, like, like I said, I miss those days. Uh, <laughs> well, but it, it doesn't... The, the fact of the matter is that what you would call austerity, which I would call proper fiscal management, real spending restraint combined with uh, lower rates, lower tax rates, we grew and restrained our way out of a serious economic problem in the 1990s. Well, I mean, I think one thing that's always important to point out when, we, when you start talking about cutting spending is uh, what the government actually spends money on. because. Um, Two thirds of it is that uh, that health insurer with the big army, um, and uh, the kind of non-defense discretionary spending that people rightfully fight about. But it's uh, it's only fifteen percent of the it's only fifteen percent of the budget. Um, you've also got these tax expenditures, the home mortgage deduction, the charitable the deductions for charitable contributions, my health care exclusion, uh, my 401k that I bet Matt and I can agree uh, you know, stuff that stuff that we don't like. Um, but, uh, you know, again, the uh, this is, you know, the, the, the idea that we have this sort of uh, this big deficit and that we've sort of had this spending explosion is not is not really borne out by the numbers right now the the, uh, the gov government spending is at its lowest level since uh, since the Eisenhower years um, and it's funny I was on the in the car on the way here I heard an ad from uh, from Alan West the uh, the Tea Party guy um, who's uh, who's complaining that you know Aside, first he says he's going to, you know, you should elect him. He's going to protect. He's going to protect Medicare, um, while Obama cut seven hundred fifteen billion dollars out of Medicare. And really, as I've said, you know, it's sort of healthcare spending is really the, uh, you know, that's gonna, that's the driver of our long term fiscal problem that I think we both agree we have. Um, we, we at some point we've got to get our our uh, you know our outflows in line with our inflows. But what it means is that we're going to have to reduce our health care costs. And uh, you know, it's obviously a different debate about Obamacare, um, but certainly that was one shot at it. And maybe uh, you know, it's going to have too many government bureaucrats making decisions that are going to ration your care. Uh, maybe it's going to, you know, there are all kinds of things that people can argue about it. But it seems to me like you want to go hunting where the ducks are, and health care and defense where the ducks are. So we'll, why don't we craft a bipartisan agreement on entitlement reform while we're here? I, by the way, I'm not sure. What, I got. I got to challenge your data. Per capita uh, federal spending is highest that it's ever been, and there's different ways to measure this. But I think by any honest measure, um, current spending plus all of these unfunded liabilities plus a, a rational look at what Obamacare is going to cost suggests that this is in fact a spending binge like we've never seen before. And I would, uh, I would suggest that looking at the history of Medicare, the first 10 years of Medicare ended up costing 700% more 
than was projected in the budget. So if you think that Obamacare is, is uh, deficit neutral, um, you, don't, you don't understand the history of health care. Well, the CBO said it was deficit reducing, right? I mean, again, right. I don't, maybe the CBO is wrong. I don't, I don't well, they know. Well, uh, uh, they only missed Medicare by 700%. So, <laughs> um, I'm not betting on it. But the, the, the challenge here, and let's talk about this for a minute. Uh, let's talk about entitlements. Do we really believe that the solution to health care and retirement entitlement problems, which is both a combination of demo demographics on the savings side, but also uh, rising costs on health care, do we really think that that which is crowding everything else out of the budget is solved by yet another entitlement, Obamacare? I think the answer has to be no. The, the understanding has to be that more government bureaucrats making decisions for you doesn't drive down health care. If it did, um, we wouldn't have an entitlement problem right now. Let me, see, let me interject here a little bit and see if I could get a little more tension between you two gentlemen. Um, <laughs> let's go tough. back. We're to, about to go form this grand bar bargain in the back. You know, so, yeah. <laughs> let's go back to fundamentals and try to flesh this out. Um, because I think Mike has a lot more confidence in the, the planners, the ruling class, not only to do what's right, but have, to have the capacity to, uh, uh, to achieve this, I don't know, utopia or a just society, a full employment society, whatever <laughs> you might want to call it. And that seems to be sort of, I may be wrong about this, that, well, they just don't have that capacity, but I'm not sure, you know, if they did, maybe it wouldn't be such a bad thing. So let me raise this question. There was a time in America where property rights was a fundamental right, just like the uh, right to speech, press, uh, religion. It was a fundamental right embedded in the Bill of Rights. Um, so even if the central planners did have the capacity and the wherewithal what about this fundamental right? What gives these planners, this ruling class, the right to redistribute somebody's property without their consent, necessarily, because we can't say our system now is based upon the consent of the governor. But what gives them the, the right, whether it's constitutional, ethical, moral, whatever, philosophical, to take someone's property without their consent? They, they don't have it. They don't have it, and the American system was always designed, the American government was designed specifically to set out rules that everybody followed. There was no notion of redistributing wealth. There wasn't the idea of taking from some to give to others. It was a set of rules that everybody followed. And we have gotten so far away from that. And the reason that it's important to understand that Washington can't rationally reallocate resources is because those old rules don't seem to apply anymore. The Constitution's been trampled on, and, and people in Washington, D.C. seemingly have no limits on what they would do when it comes to our health care, when it comes to energy, when it comes to bailing out banks. I mean, I happen to think that the bailout was unconstitutional, but they still did it. So how do you deal with this in a world where politics is everything, and the assumption is, is that some people are smarter than you, and some people have, are just a little more virtuous. They're not going to be corrupted by the, the things that corrupt you and I in our daily lives. We're all self-interested, right? Adam Smith said it. But the assumption in Keynesian economics, the assumption in all macroeconomics, is the moment that you're sworn into public office, the moment that you become a bureaucrat at the Department of Energy, you leave all your self-interest at the door. Think about a naive assumption that is. Well, I guess, first of all, I would say that the idea of these, you know, my, my statist vision for, <laughs> for the end of 2008 and the beginning of 2009 was not this, uh, you know, big government utopia. It was preventing a catastrophe. Um, you know, we were, I mean, negative 9% economic growth. Um, I don't recommend it. That's a, those are depression numbers. And at, uh, at that level, you're, you know, that's how you get to 25% unemployment, which is going to ravage a lot of lives, uh, people who didn't deserve it, people who are children. And if, if, if you think you know, maybe the government caused it, we can argue about that all day. But if they did, then the government better stop it um, because uh, that was a, uh, 
that was a nightmare. And and like I said, it's legitimate to say that you know maybe the government maybe it was unconstitutional to bail out the banks. It was certainly annoying um, trying to you know having to help out these uh, these idiots who got us into the problem in the first place. Um, but uh, you know when the uh, when the elephants fall, the grass gets trampled, and it prevented an awful lot of pain um, and suffering. It, this does partly go down to you know what is what is the right of the people we elect to uh, to spend our money. I guess part of this does go down to without getting political about it. I mean, it goes down to your your vision of what what government is about. And now we're sort of out of the technical arguments that we've been having. But essentially, it's like does the does the government have a responsibility to protect the uh, the poor? Does you know are we all in it together? As you as you hear so so often, certainly for our mutual defense, certainly for uh, the kind of you know, mutual support, um, whether, and we can argue about the details of whether does the government need to provide road? Does the government need to provide sewers? Could that be provided privately? Um, but there are certainly, does the government need to provide education? Um, we've decided in our society that it does. Um, now it's, okay, now we have this, uh, this, this uh, infrastructure that's set up, and what are we going to do about it? You know, I don't think we have a free market in energy. Um, you know, if what gives you the right to, you know, give my kid asthma with your coal plant next door? Um, there ought to be, you know, and th you ought to pay for those externalities. Um, right now, that's uh, that's not part of our system. So, again, I think uh, you know, this goes back to that we're already more than a, a little bit pregnant. Um, and it goes back to what is what is your vision, and uh, you know, do we have any responsibility to people? There's this moral argument that you know we're America and we don't let people starve, uh, which you hear all across the uh, the political spectrum. And then there's also this the economic argument that goes with it, which is that you know when our schools are horrible, um, when our uh, you know our healthcare when people can't afford their healthcare. When uh, you know when our energy system is broiling the planet, it's not only a a moral problem, and when people don't have when people at the bottom don't have any money, but it's also an economic problem. That you know it was the consumer, there was the strength of the middle class and the consumer society that boomed after World War II, um, that provided this great economy that we have. That better schools and investments in people's human capital. Um, when their children will give them a real opportunity to to thrive and invent the businesses of the future, which they'll be even more likely to do if they know that you know if their business fails, they're not going to be completely destitute. And that health care cost that you know right now it's the main cause of personal bankruptcy. It's the main drag on our private economy, uh, on our private companies. You know, you might ask why GM went under. Part of it is because it's paying too much in health care costs. And, uh, and it's the reason that our country is going bankrupt, that if government can help provide a way to reduce those costs in the future, it's not just moral, but it's also smart. Well, you, you mentioned education and health care, and then I, I want to get back to a bigger point. But uh, um, I hope that no one in this room thinks that, that our current K-12 education system is, is a shining example of, of what government does well. It's a fundamental problem, and it's really, it boils down to basic economics, as Milton Friedman pointed out. You create a monopoly system, top-down, one-size-fits-all, and you're going to have skyrocketing costs and, and reduced quality. In the case of education, it's about the future of our children. So it, it does, it's not just an economic issue, it's a moral issue. But um, certainly this administration and, and probably most of your friends on the left think that the solution to a broken system is to spend even more on education and to get the federal government more involved in a, in a system that, that is utterly failing because there is not enough parental choice, there is not enough um, decision making from the bottom up. How could some bureaucrat at the Department of Education possibly know what's best for the kids of Florida? How is that possible? Well, remember that uh, that one of the things the stimulus did was create race to the top, which, as Jeb Bush would say, is uh, you know Jeb Bush is a huge fan of race to the top because it's doing the sorts of things that that you talk about. It's injecting charter schools and choice into into education. It's it is providing a sort of national standards that are going to hold teachers unions to account. Um, it's actually a very a very conservative uh, and I think an excellent advance in uh, in in public education, which is the sort of uh, you know injecting that kind kind of accountability, as well as transparency, which is another big part of the stimulus. Um, you know, it's the most transparent government spending in the history of government. So, let me ask you, do you support 
competition in education? Do you believe that parents should should be allowed to choose where their kids go to school? Yeah, yeah. I think the I think the government should make sure that everybody can uh, everybody can afford an education, but uh, and I think the government should set standards um, for what that these schools will have to meet. Um, but yeah, after that, I don't I don't really give a rat's ass how you know who does it. Go go where you want to go. Well, let, let's talk about health care because I think this is a, this is an ongoing failure to understand what's going on right now. Before Obamacare, um, over fifty cents of every dollar in health care is is paid by a federal government program, Medicare and Medicaid in particular, and you have this this system of third party payments. Again, a system um, created by the federal government where you typically get health care from your employer, right? So you don't know about the price of health care, and you generally don't get to decide what that health care package is. It's always a third party, usually your employer, but maybe it's some bureaucrat at, at Health and Human Services that decides which benefits package is best for you. Well, guess what? Everyone in this room needs a different benefits package because you're all different. You all have health, different health care problems. You all have different uh, uh, senses for what's best for you. Under Obamacare, and I find this fascinating that the left let this happen. Under Obamacare, the health insurance industry was able to dictate a one-size-fits-all benefits package, which now you have to buy by federal law. And if you're 27 years old and you can't afford a Cadillac plan, you would rather buy a catastrophic plan that, that because you're young, you're healthy, and you don't make that much money. Under Obamacare, you are forced to subsidize the health care of older, less healthy, more wealthy people. Talk about redistribution of wealth from poor and healthy to wealthy and less healthy. This is what happens when government gets involved. A better system would be allow for patients and doctors to make those decisions without a middleman, particularly the federal government. So I, I don't buy this idea that just because you believe that more and more people should have access to more and more care, that somehow the government is going to solve that problem. The history is the exact opposite. Well, I mean, I, and this is another, another area where um, it may be true in, in Matt's uh, in Matt's kind of libertarian utopia where the government steps away from this stuff, um, you know, there if you're poor and you're sick, um, you're kind of on your own. And that, that may work better. And certainly nobody's, uh, right, nobody's going to get redis you know, their money redistributed to help them. In the current system, we've got this sort of hybrid private-public system. Uh, if you're poor and you're sick, you end up rolling into the emergency room, and we all pay for that, too. Um, you know, this is one of the, uh, you know, and this is somewhere where, where Matt, is a, Matt is a principled, limited government conservative. Um, as he knows probably better than anybody, uh, the majority of the, you know, Republican Party in Washington um, is not. Um, and, uh, and that's why you hear, you know, that's why you hear this, you know, Obama's cutting Medicare. Um, how, how horrible is this? I mean, they're not, this is not a, uh, you know, they're not pushing for a true free market in healthcare any more than they're pushing for a true free market in energy or a true free market in education or a true free market period. Um, one of the themes of my book, and this is, I think, why I end up getting invited to be on, on the left in a debate like this, but it's very harsh on the, on the Republican Party, who they opened up with me, and, and they're very, very clear that essentially, you know, as George Voinovich said on the record, if Obama was for it, we had to be against it. And that's why things that had always been bipartisan, like the smart grid or health IT um, or extending unemployment benefits or middle class tax cuts, you know, suddenly became Sharia socialism. Um, and it's why the individual mandate that came out of Mitt Romney's health care plan and the cap and trade that was part of McCain Palin's energy plan in, in 2008, and just the basic idea of Keynesian stimulus that had a lot of support, you know, Republican support, not not for Matt, I'm not indicting him in this, um, but that you know suddenly also became uh, you know an assault on on free enterprise. It's just something to to keep in mind as we enter this silly season. Now, well, before you respond, let me uh, invite those who may want to ask questions to line up behind the respective mics. Okay, sorry, Matt. I think I heard you making my argument because you're <laughs> arguing that politicians act politically, and and I'm suggesting that that's the very nature of politics. Republicans and Democrats act 
to get elected, and does that mean that they're going to adhere to free market principle? Um, maybe, maybe not. It all depends on what they think their, their best opportunity is to get reelected. And to let a political marketplace make economic decisions, given those incentives, which are fundamental, there is no real solution to the fact that politicians act politically. Um, that means that the economic plans that they make are inherently political as well. It means that Solyndra gets first consideration because they know somebody in Washington, D.C. It means that GE gets the contract over somebody else because they hired an army of lobbyists to uh, solicit the committee chairman. There is no way to work around this fundamental flaw. This is classic public choice economics. James Buchanan wrote a book called uh, Democracy and Deficit where he offered what I think is a fundamental critique of Keynes. Politicians love to spend money in a recession because that's what politicians do. When it comes time to cut spending during the economic boom, politicians keep spending money. We were spending all, money all the way up. We were spending like drunken sailors all the way up to the 2008 crash. So if spending money we don't have is in fact an economic stimulus, how do you explain the crash? But more importantly, how do you get rid of 16 trillion in debt that we, that we don't have? Well, the, I mean, the first point is that the whole, well, I mean, what Keynes would say is that when, you know, when the economy is, you know, okay, that's when you're, that's when you're supposed to be cutting back. Now, the political point you, you make is, is something that we're not that far apart on. And that's why I would say, you know, that this is, this is why I'm not, you know, in, in normal times, I'm, you know, you can't invite me to, to be on the left in these things. I think Matt and I can go backstage and we're going to eliminate all federal support for housing um, of, of every kind, and with that, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna take a big chunk in that in that grand bargain. Um, one of the, you know, when when unemployment when GDP is crashing at a nine percent rate, that's uh, that's one kind of emergency. And issues like like uh, you know, take energy, which to me is a is a global and national emergency, and that goes to our national security, our environmental security, our economic security. Um, that's something that I, you know, since there is no carbon tax or a carbon price, that's something where I reluctantly think that the government does have to get involved. And what I would say there is, and you know, you tell the story in the book, and this is this is this kind of green industrial policy that gives me a little bit of the heebie-jeebies too, um, though clearly not as much as Matt. Um, um, what I would say is, you know, read the book, and what you'll see is, you know, they brought in 4,500 independent experts to make sure this stuff wasn't done by politics. Um, that the portfolio, you know, all you hear about is Solyndra, 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 but John McCain's finance chairman um, did a review of the entire portfolio, and it's doing perfectly fine. Um, that, you know, the Bush administration actually chose Solyndra out of 143 companies to get the first clean energy loan. It raised a billion dollars in private capital. You know, it went it went bad because solar prices went went south, and uh, and that destroyed its business model. You know, it's not a scandal, but it is it is an inevitable result of this kind of tinkering. I can't, you know, I certainly can't deny that. Um, in the same way that, you know, some some houses that get home mortgage deductions are going to go into foreclosure, and uh, you know, some companies that get tax breaks that don't get all this attention are going to go bust too. Um, you know, there's... Mike, we're going to have to uh, move yeah. to the Q&A because we have sure. quite a few people that want to ask questions. Please keep your questions precise. Direct them to either Mike, Matt, or both, and keep your responses as, uh, as brief as possible. We'll start with the gentleman on my right. This question is directed to uh, Matt. Given the Federal Reserve is conducting a third round of quantitative <laughs> easing, and China, together with other Pacific Rim nations, as well as Latin American countries, are in the process of setting up trading relationships that bypass the U.S. dollar. How do you think the rejection of the dollar as the world reserve currency will affect our country? It's a disaster because it, it immediately leads to a higher cost of borrowing. And given how much uh, money we're currently borrowing, um, a small change in that percentage rate um, puts us at, at real risk of, of being downgraded yet again. I would just say that Matt and his Austrian pal, pals have predicted about 72 of the last zero runs on the dollar. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll, we'll come back. Could, could happen. We'll but come back. Hasn't discuss. happened. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. This mic on. <clears throat> yeah. This mic on. 
Uh, this is a question that I pose to, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, to either of you or both of you, and that is that is this country past the tipping point where it's too late to counteract a burgeoning socialistic philosophy and also too late to re uh, reawaken uh, the moral imperative of freedom where people are more responsible and self-reliant? I'll, I'm happy to take that. <laughs> yeah, you can go first. I mean, you know, I, I mean, you know, socialism is, is uh, this very specific definition of what socialism is, and this ain't it. Um, you know, the, 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 take the Obama stimulus, which not only didn't involve government ownership of the means of production, um, but it, uh, it didn't even grow the government. It, uh, it, you know, we've lost 600,000 600, government jobs in this socialistic era of the last, the last four years um, after gaining uh, several million during the um, free market paradise of the Bush years. Um, look, I think uh, there has not been a, uh, you know, a sort of radical shift in governing philosophy. And what Obama has said during the campaign has been you know, pretty much what he stuck to. The, the, this didn't even create those alphabet agencies with millions of government workers. It only created one new agency with 25, with, uh, with 25 employees. So, uh, you know, I think there are different places on the political spectrum, but this idea that Tim Geithner and Larry Summers are, you know, sort of Birkenstock hippies and, you know, socialist uh, tyrants is just, um, it's, 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 more, it's, more, it's more government control of the means of production, which is the Italian model, right? And I, I think that better explains what's going on. To answer your question, I happen to think that the internet and the decentralization of information and our ability to set up our RSS feeds to, to bypass the old information monopoly, of course, time being, being the exception to that rule, absolutely. <laughs> Not for long. <laughs> um, that means that citizens who are the outsiders in this model have an ability to know what the insiders are up to. And, and by the insiders, I mean the entire political class, Republican, Democrat, bureaucrats, all of the people that come to Washington, D.C. to lobby. That was the old closed system that drove up the size and scope of government. It's our responsibility as citizens to take some of that responsibility back. And it starts with real information. It starts with social networking, connecting with other people. So I don't think we've gone too far, but man, are we getting close. Okay, question? Yes, uh, following up on the last question from the fellow in front of me, um, the, the issue for me is that we've got a $16 trillion debt growing to a $20 trillion debt with artificially low interest rates. What happens to all or both of the discussions here when the interest rate normalizes to what historically has been the interest rate, and our interest rate turns around at a three, four, five percent instead of a half a percent or one percent, and what does that do to our ability to do much of anything in the government and be able to support a government? I think it's a fiscal time bomb, and maybe you disagree, but I think that's going to be a real problem when debt payments become a dominant um, piece of our ledger. That's combined with over a hundred trillion in unfunded liabilities that, that is our obligation for Medicare, Social Security, and, and some other entitlement programs. There is no way that we can keep doing this the way we're doing it. We're gonna to have to figure out a different way to do it, and, and maybe the next panel can be on moving from that top-down defined benefit system that is going to pay less and less and charge more and more to a system where people have some real ownership in their own retirement and their own health care. I mean, I think right now, I mean, I think we have a long-term time bomb that I've discussed. I think it has a lot to do with dealing with, uh, dealing with health care. Um, I think we have a short-term jobs problem. And, uh, you know, I think when interest rates are, whether they're artificially low or, uh, you know, they are what they are, it sounds like a good time to, uh, you know, to borrow some money and, uh, and build some stuff that will put people to work and those people will pay taxes and, uh, and create jobs and create that sort of virtuous cycle that I talked about that'll, uh, you know, that'll end up reducing the deficit and ultimately give us some of that space to deal with the debt. Sounds like the Chris Dodd plan. <laughs> no, Good. Uh, you can't, you can't pin Chris left. Dodd on me. <laughs> okay, this is uh, for the gentleman on the left, and I mean on the left. Um, 
You guys don't know what the left is. You guys have been a... <laughs> so far tonight, your favorite word has been taxes. Tax this, tax that, tax this, carbon tax, carbon tax, carbon tax. It's the only one. I think okay, I... now wait a minute. Yeah. Now wait a minute. Let me get my... Yeah, don't... Ask the question. Here's my question. Out. You're adding taxes to everything that, you're, that people are making, you know, that are pr producing. Those people don't pay the taxes. The people here in this arena are paying those taxes. Every time they put a tax on something, they incorporate it into the pro price of something else, and we're paying the tax for the sucker on the top. So you're not hurting the, the, uh, the rich with higher taxes. You're hurting us, the little people. Who's you? I mean, I, uh, I mean, I talked about how there were three hundred billion dollars in tax cuts in the in the stimulus. Um, they were then they were then extended. There have been uh, there have been overall, I think, uh, about about a trillion dollars of tax cuts in the first four years. Um, I don't remember how much Obamacare has some tax increases that go over time, but uh, the idea that this has been some kind of tax crazy uh, tax crazy four years, um, you know, is not looking at the history of the last four years, and the and the idea of pinning on me, yeah, I think we should have a carbon tax, and we should use that. You should use the money and reduce the payroll tax. Um, okay, yeah, well, you'll get a less of a payroll tax. <laughs> but Mike, I, let me maybe we should. could clarify. Is, is, Wait, why are you rolling your eyes? That's the uh, that's. You're already paying a payroll tax. I'm saying you're going to get less payroll tax. We're going to increase carbon tax, and that's going to create virtuous things in the in the energy industry because it's going to create this uh, this where people who are now polluting with carbon, um, it's going to create a disincentive to do that. They're going to pay for their externalities in the same way that uh, you know that's that's Austrian economics, that's Milton Friedman economics, and it's Keynesian. Well, Mike, economics. let me ask you this. Perhaps Matt could uh, chime in. It, it, or is quantitative easing a form of a hidden tax, not only on the people that are affected by the depreciation of the purchasing power of the dollar, but also uh, future generations? That's a, that's a great question. Probably the honest answer is I don't know. Um, you know, it's right now, it's looking good just because of where interest rates are, but certainly it's, uh, you know, there's, there's a fear about what can happen to it. And I happen to agree with Matt that I think we're mostly pushing on a string. I don't think that, mon that monetary, monetary stimulus is going to do all that much right now. Um, you know, it could create a little bit of inflation, and actually a little bit of inflation could be helpful in, in some ways. Uh, you can all, you know, start shooting me now. Um, but uh, but uh, in general, I think, you know, we're, at some point there's going to have to be an exit strategy. Right now, what the, free, what the market is saying is that it's not a crisis. Um, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not a wild fan of additional monetary stimulus. So the, the, the problem with uh, that expansion of money and credit is if you hold cash in your wallet or if you have a savings account, like most people do, um, they're expanding the money supply and you're losing value. If you happen to be a billionaire that knows how to work money and hedges against that kind of thing, you're fine. Um, so I, I view it as a very insidious form of taxation and a very regressive one. Right. Question? Well, you know, for, for the borrowers, it's doing all right. And that's 67% of the country with, uh, you know, who are homeowners. And so, you know, if you have a mortgage, that cheap money is helping you right now. Question? Yeah, my question is for the man on the left. Um, I think we're all looking for... That? You are pretty far to the left. <laughs> I don't know about middle of the road. That's but your new title, I think we're all looking here for the right economic philosophy. And in order, in order for a philosophy to be right, I think that its assumptions have to be true and it has to be internally coherent. And you said, you acknowledged that the Austrian school has an internally coherent philosophy, right? It's internally logical. And so I thought maybe that it was just the assumptions with which you disagreed, but then you later went on to say that maybe the libertarian utopian society would be the better society. I guess it would be more prosperous. So I, my question then is, what is it that you disagree with about the Austrian school? Like, the assumptions, as an example, is it the human nature? Um, that, well, I guess the Austrian school's conception of human nature with which you disagree, or something else? Well, I'm not, look, I'm not, you know, I'm not an economist, and I know, I, you know, I'm going to... You know, but I, I do think that uh, you, know, you said, is it going to work? As a, is it going to be a more prosperous society? And I think the answer is it would be more prosperous for some people, but not for others. Um, you know, I do, I do believe that, there's a, that we have certain obligations to each other as citizens. Um, 
And, uh, and I also think that, you know, without going too, too deep into it, I think that it's that while it is an internally coherent philosophy in the same way that, you know, Kantianism is and Richard Murdochism is, um, I think, uh, you know, it hasn't always, you know, it hasn't always matched with the, you know, the reality in the world that we've lived. The general lady on my left, do you have a question? Professor De La Rosa, I was glad to hear you speak about private property, and I wondered if the two gentlemen would like to speak about Agenda 21, otherwise known as sustainable development. I'll be happy to talk about it. I, this has been something that we've been fighting as long as I've been involved in public policy, and it's as simple, simple as a local county or, ordinance that tells you what you can't do on your own property. It's as complicated as, as being a um, um, strategy driven by foreign national governments. It gets back to this principle, though. If you own something, it's yours. And I think that's important for, for this country to survive. And if, and if we get away from that, and once you sort of open the floodgates to the idea that some third party gets to dictate what you do on your property, it's not clear what the limit is. Because I think, uh, I think what Michael is trying to describe with his vision, it's very discretionary. And it's always dependent on somebody doing the right thing at the right moment. And my question is, how do you even know what the right thing is? And why do you think that some third party who you don't know, you've never met, and they couldn't possibly care about your family, why would they? Why would they? You know, I actually, the, without getting too deep into Agenda 21, this actually, we, uh, Bill and I were discussing this earlier, that one of my, um, this, to me, one of the biggest obstacles to sustainable development in America um, is actually something that to me, there's a perfect opportunity for the left and the right to sort of join hands, get together. Because to me, it's, it's regulatory restrictions on urban development. Um, it's snob zoning, and it's, uh, you know, it's basically telling developers downtown that, oh, you can't, be, you can't build those dense, uh, those, those, that dense skyscraper because you know, we don't want poor people living next door. And to me, that's a perfect example of a private property issue that, unfortunately, conservatives have shown no interest in because you know, it's, you know, they, they associate it with, I guess, liberals who care, who don't like sprawl, and you know, that's a city thing. Um, but the reason we have these, you know, one of the reasons we have these incredibly, you know, sprawling, exurban, unsustainable patterns is because developers who want to build something in an area where there are already people can't do it because all the NIMBYs come around and say you can't do it. And all the counties have these uh, incredible restrictions that the guy at the Cato Institute who writes about housing and transportation is horrible about. <laughs> um, you know, it's suddenly he forgets he's a libertarian. It's very, it's very bizarre. Question? Hello, I'm Kevin, and uh, I don't agree that government should be large, especially with regard as to what I do in my free time and at my home. But the issue is that, is gov that, is that government is the reason, if the issue is that government is the reason why we are in this bad situation, and they were, that we are in as if they're, they're the, the long-reaching arm is the problem, what I'm afraid of is the impact on our labor and uneducated portion of our population. I'm afraid that it's going to go back to that laissez-faire economy a laissez-faire during the Lochner era, which is probably the biggest reason the Great Depression occurred, the freedom of contract to work as, as you like. But the reality is big corporations that, give, that, that, gives, that takes lots and gives less deserve little, you know, this, uh, and it's the little working man that gets screwed. Less government and more deregulation. I'm afraid as the legal ramifications of less government, less regulation, because I believe in a free market economy, of course. But to me, a truly free one makes me free not only from the government, but also from my boss and, and my rights. So how does either side address that issue with regards to the deregulation and possible discrimination, which I believe the Civil Rights Act wouldn't have been possible in a laissez-faire economy? Oh, I don't agree with that, but I, that's a great question. And I would, what I would say that, remember, and, and people get confused about this, the Civil Rights Movement was a fight against local governments dictating what you couldn't, couldn't do. 
that's what that fight was about. It was, in the words of Martin Luther King, it was a fight about judging people based on the content of their character, not the color of their skin. Think about the, the love that we have for the Constitution and the idea that under our notion of justice, you treat everybody exactly like everybody else. That's very consistent with, with where Dr. King was and very consistent with the laissez-faire position. I happen to be a small government, small libertarian precisely because I'm worried about the loss of opportunity. I think what's special about America is the fact that everybody, anybody, can do anything in this country. That's not true in most of the countries I've been at. In most of the countries that I visit, in, in Latin America, in Europe, all over the world, there is a clear line between the haves and the have-nots. There's generations of wealth that has been, that, that has been protected from from very socialist, very big government policies. And so you have rich people. Every country I've ever been in has rich people. But what you don't have in most countries is the opportunity for people that are climbing up the economic ladder to become the next Bill Gates or the President of the United States. That is what freedom is all about. That is why we fight for this. Yeah. This is, this is where they probably should have invited somebody who is from the real left who could make a more, uh, you know, more robust defense of unions and, uh, and, uh, and sort of paleoliberalism, which is not my thing. Um, uh, what, I, what I would say is that um, there's, a, there's a real feeling that equal opportunity in this, look, we, have, we do have this country. We have a, a government that has, even if it was just gonna be national defense, we all have to pay for it. Um, and somehow it's become the conservative position that, for instance, like, you know, the heirs of, that it's, that it's a, an attack on your private property if you're a, a you know, a, an heiress of, a, you know, of, a, of your billionaire dad that you're entitled to inherit his entire estate. Um, you know, while, and at the same time that it's somehow outrageous that 47% of the country doesn't pay income taxes, um, although they do pay taxes on their income and gas taxes and sales taxes and property taxes and state and local taxes. Um, everybody who, who works is a maker, um, and uh, most of the others of the 47% are in the military or they're, uh, they're on Social Security. Um, so when you hear about broadening the base, um, that's basically a way of saying that poor people need to pay more taxes. Um, part of this argument, it's not about socialism versus capitalism. Um, it's about it's uh, you know it's about gradations about who should be paying the freight and uh, you know and who you know how much you know how big a government we're going to have and then who's going to pay for it and uh, and those are things that reasonable people can disagree about um, as you know as hopefully you've seen um, you know there seems to be quite a lot that Matt and I agree about and that where we could cut a deal tomorrow and then there's some stuff where we just have have different philosophies and that's okay that's why we have a democratic system. That'll, uh, that'll hash it out. Okay, let me, uh, Francisco, we're, it's 8.30. How much more time do we have? Okay. Um, yes, sir. Sure, I'm probably one of the few people in the room who are on the, the left side over there, <laughs> uh, agreeing with Michael. So this is a question for Matt. Um, uh, one about a comment you made, and then uh, something I didn't know if you really answered it, the point that Michael made. One was you said the founders thought everyone should be treated like everyone else, and Seems to me the founders were the elitists of the elites. Uh, I mean, they, the Constitution is an anti-democratic document in many ways. The Republic, the Electoral College, all those things. So how does that work into the elitist, elitism, people like Hamilton, Jefferson, and so on? But my question about the economics is, um, you know, you keep saying that the government shouldn't get involved, shouldn't get involved, but what about this issue that, that Michael brought up about that by the time FDR takes office, the Great Depression is getting worse and worse and worse and worse, and it's not until the government steps in, and really until the second New Deal, that the, the depression begins to recede, and it's that government intervention. So how, how do you work in, what, why is that a wrong assessment, let's say, of, of what's happening with the Great Depression? Okay, so, so let's, let's talk about the founders for a minute. I, I think it's uh, fascinating. I'd, I would recommend to everyone a book that I discovered while I was writing my book called The Ideological Origins of the American Revolution. And, uh, I would argue that, that Thomas Jefferson was a radical Democrat. And, and I, most, most leftists I know feel that way as well. Uh, Jefferson happens to be... I'm a Hamilton guy. <laughs> See, there you go. Yeah, ha Hamilton was the elitist. He was the top-down guy that, that wanted to dictate things. So, so clearly we have a disagreement there. But, 
<laughs> if, you read, if you read that book and you really go back and study America's founding, the, the immaculate conception notion that all these really smart guys got in the room together and conceived this, this miraculous system isn't really true. What was going on was a lot of grassroots organizing by guys like Sam Adams. He was recruiting guys on the dock at Boston Harbor. He was uh, doing exactly what Tea Partiers do today. He was putting pressure on the New York delegation to sign the declaration. Um, so I would argue that even that system was very bottom up. It was very much the, the citizens in the streets demanding that they do something. Um, but that's, that's a different history, I suspect, than, than some people view. Now the other question, remind me. New Deal. New Deal. Oh, New Deal. New Deal is a, the, the, uh, I'm trying to decide where to start this story because we could be here all night, so. Hmm. Uh, but the, but, but, but the, the response that we would have is that the, uh, the crash of 29 was a combination of really bad ideas coming from the government. Um, part of it was uh, raising taxes, part of it was protectionism, and part of it was the Federal Reserve juicing the system, creating an artificial bubble that had to break and, and the system had to come down. The response to that, more taxes, more protectionism, more government, only prevents the, the market and people from cleaning up the mess that government made. That's, that's how it happened and that's why we, we never got, really got out of the Great Depression for years and years. That's, that's not typical of how markets work. There has to be some explanation for that and it was too much government, uh, too much, frankly too much, uh, FDR was famous for experimenting. He, he used to throw stuff against the wall and see if it would, it would work. And that creates radical uncertainty for people that are thinking about creating jobs people that are thinking about investing. You don't know what the rules are. Part of that is happening today. It's not at all clear what this administration is going to do to change the rules of the game, the price of capital, uh, the price of labor, all of these things that you, that you crunch the numbers when you're an entrepreneur to decide whether or not you're gonna invest. You know, I, I would agree with, I would actually agree with almost all of that because I'm, again, the wrong guy here because we agree about protectionism. FDR's protectionism was ridiculous. FDR's tax increases were ridiculous. Um, but, but some of the, uh, the, the Keynesian stuff in the New Deal worked really well because unemployment went from 25% to 14%. And that I think there's, there's got to be an explanation for, even despite some of the bad stuff. And I think the obvious one is, is uh, the stimulus in there. And there's a reason that once they stop the stimulus, that's when things went the other, other direction towards the recession of 37, 38. Then they started the war, which is the ultimate stimulus, and, uh, and things got, got right. Well, that, that drop in unemployment, do they use the same racket where people that aren't looking for employment are no longer counted, or part-time employment's counted as employment? What was the mechanism for collecting the data in the 1930s regarding the drop in unemployment? Oh, I mean, I think there, I, I think what you may be referring to is there, there is this, this book, uh, Amity Schles's book, uh, where she sort of argues that the, the New Deal didn't work because, look, there was 17% unemployment in 1938 after that austerity. Um, but one thing that she does is, and I guess you can argue about this, is that she doesn't count government jobs as, uh, as jobs. Um, feel like jobs. You got a paycheck. You know, they're not, you know they, obviously they... You know, in, okay. in this particular stimulus, there weren't a lot. There weren't a lot of them, but uh, but there was. Uh, you know, that's why the jobless yeah. rate went down. And World War II created a lot of government jobs too, and uh, it didn't create a real economic hangover afterwards. Actually, the okay. you know, uh, economy got pretty good. Gentleman has a question. Thank you, um, John Iannone, senior finance major here at the Heisinga School. Um, I have hardly any doubt that the college world is the next economic freight train to be derailed with the oncoming student loan crisis. Could you please uh, comment on the influence that taxpayer subsidies have had from the Department of Education and whether this potential calamity has the momentum to take the economy down the way the housing market did? Thank you. Well, it's definitely the next bubble, and I would recommend that you read the education chapter in my book, which happens to be available outside for purchase. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I, you know, when I started looking at uh, some of the early 
motives of the occupiers, the, the first generation who were showing up in Zuccotti Park, one of the things that's going on is the fact that, that, that higher education costs so much money. And it is heavily subsidized by the federal government. It's, it reminds me almost exactly like the housing bubble. The idea was to get more people into college education. Good goal. Um, the means by which they did that drove up the cost of education, ironically making it more difficult for people at the lower rungs of the economic ladder to get a college education. The net result is you graduate with twenty, forty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 in college debt, and here in the Obama economy, you can't get a job. I'd be pissed off too. I would show up, and I would be mad at the fact that the banks got the bailout, and I didn't. I think that's what's going on. I, we're, we're ignoring this higher education bubble, and it's going to be a mess. I just point out that one thing uh, that maybe, and I'd be interested to hear what Matt thinks about, but one thing that Obama did, and it was part of the that kind of weird mechanism where they passed health care, was, uh, and again, whether you agree with student loans or not, um, the, the situation over for quite a long time has been there have been these kind of middlemen rent seekers who have used their access to government in a way that Matt describes so well to essentially kind of get this gigantic cut of the student loan business without without competition. Um, and Obama now maybe should just get rid of student loans or whatever. But they, he didn't do that. But what Obama did was just cut them out. And uh, I think it's a it's a pretty good reform. Then he used some of it to pump up Pell Grants that maybe people won't agree with, and some of it to, uh, went to, you know, to Obamacare and deficit reduction. But in any case, that particular reform, I think, has sort of made, you know, if we're going to have this mixed economy, um, it's a good way of keeping the rent seekers out. Okay. Time is short, so we're going to have to be brief. Yes, sir. Okay, absolutely. I have uh, actually a couple questions about your well, references to... Just one to... question. Okay. Just one. Can I ask it? Ask your best question. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question about the, your, your comment about IT. You seem to think that uh, streamlining IT will go a long, long way in uh, making Obamacare a little bit more cost effective. And I'm wondering why you'd uh, look at IT as a solution when simply, because of all the informational uh, meandering that goes on and all the multiple forms that have to be filled out, why not just reduce the number of forms that have to be filled out by reducing regulations and maybe cutting some of these departments and agencies which make it so complicated? Well, I'll just do a quick response, which is that there's a reason we have online banking and online dating. Um, you know, it's efficient, right? Um, and uh, and there are sort of entry barriers and free rider problems that I won't describe for the reason that we don't have online medicine. But it's just preposterous that you two doctors can't discuss the same file if they're not in the same room. But the government doesn't subsidize online same, dating. They, no, but but uh, but the government does subsidize health care. You know and since what the government, by the, way, so the government has an interest <laughs> in yet. keeping the cost of health care down and uh, and health IT. Um, this is something that Newt Gingrich and Hillary Clinton worked on together, mm -hmm. and uh, all across the political spectrum, people are people will agree that if you want to reduce your those redundant visits, those redundant tests, there's so much waste created by our clipboard system of medicine. Um, that uh, you know that that this is going to it's going to reduce that it's not going to make this into a paragon of efficiency and we're still going to have a mixed system where government's going to be involved in healthcare, but uh, you know your doctor hey, might not kill you I with his chicken scratch. We have writing. time for one more question. If government is the monopoly of the use of force, what virtuous role is there for government, and at what size do we limit government? That's a great question and uh, a, gr a great way to end this. Uh, I, my view of the founding and the genius of the Constitution was not to create good government or bad government, but the founders understood human nature and they wanted to create a limited government. They wanted to keep government in its cage so that it wouldn't become this unwieldy, dangerous use of, of the monopoly of force on, on our citizens. That's what the Constitution was about. That's what the, the checks and balances were all about. We've gotten away from that, and I fear that in the process, there is all sorts of abuses of power that goes on every day. That's what the, I think that's what we're debating about up here. I think, I think that's frankly what this election is about. And it's, the question is whether or not citizens 
have, are going to take the responsibility to take that power back from government and put it back in its cage. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the check on government is, uh, is democracy. And, um, and uh, you know, I don't think that the reason we, you know, I pay, yeah, because I'm an idiot, I live in, I live in Florida, which has, uh, has, has no income tax, but yet I work for a New York corporation and a, a New York City corporation. I'm paying New York City uh, income taxes, um, not because New York City has a standing army, um, but because this is the uh, this is the system that we have uh, we have agreed to take part in. It's sort of our you know as citizens, we uh, you know we we pays our taxes and we uh, we gets our benefits and uh, and the democratic system is about sort of fighting about what those taxes and benefits are going to be. Um, you know I think what I just resist is this notion that in certainly in the last four years, but that even in the last you know, several years that we've had some incredible diminution of, of liberty. Um, what we've had is you know, this, we're having a big argument over whether the top tax rate should be the 39% or 38, 39% that it was in the Clinton era or the uh, you know, 35, 36% that it is now. And that's a, that's a, perfectly, that's a perfectly legitimate argument to have. Um, is it a, does it go to our fundamental human rights? You know, I, I would suggest not. Thank you, gentlemen. I'm going to turn the floor back over to Francisco. Well, uh, I don't know if anybody can hear me on this, but I just want to thank you for all attending. Uh, one, I want to thank our great moderator, Marshall DeRosa. He, he made sure every he made sure it got a little feisty in here. So uh, thank you. Um, and I, I, do, I do want to thank our great uh, speakers here tonight, Matt Kibbe and Michael Grunwald as well. Thank you. Awesome. And most importantly, I want to thank Matt's wife, Terry, for allowing him to do this on their uh, 26th <laughs> wedding anniversary. So thank you so much. Um, also want to thank all the people viewing online. We've had lots of people viewing and tweeting and all that sort of stuff, and it's pretty fun. Um, we are recording this as well um, for a distribution later, so visit the James Madison Institute's website if you want to recap this, share this with your friends. Uh, we'll have that information out there. Uh, again, uh, visit jamesmadison.org. But just wanted to thank you all for being here. There is a book signing, uh, so thank these speakers by perhaps uh, purchasing one of their books, um, and uh, you'll get to meet them and chat with them afterwards as well right behind the doors here. So thanks so much for being here, and have a very safe drive home tonight in this weather.